Great. Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Walk. I'm the director of Old First Concerts, and it's a privilege to welcome you here this evening to a very special event with Quinteto Latino. Uh, not just a concert, but also a conversation with Armando Castellano, their director, uh, about issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in the arts, especially uh, in respect to Latino uh, art, musicians and composers. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening, Armando. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt, and for for um, for offering to have this, allowing me to have this conversation along with the music. You know, this is the the best of Quinteto Latino when we can perform and talk about these core parts of our mission around race equity and classical music. So thanks a lot. It's great. Yes, and um, so uh, tonight's program will be divided into uh, three separate discussions. Uh, the first one will focus a little bit about uh, the history of Quinteto Latino and its founding. And then the uh, second discussion will focus on Latino artists and uh, how uh, they are making it into the pipeline, into uh, today's orchestras and ensembles. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll be talking about the, the paradigm shift for uh, the power structures in classical music, uh, foundations. Everyone is, is trying to uh, figure out how to make a difference in um, bringing more and more uh, black, indigenous, people of color, uh, composers and music to the classical world, which is very historically white and male dominated. So 
Uh, we have uh, some very interesting topics this evening, and Armando is a, is an expert in the field, so we're, we're lucky to have him. Thank you so much. And um, please be sure, if you have any questions or comments about these issues, please be sure to mention them in the chat, and we will respond to those as we go along. Yes, we really want it to be interactive, and uh, we will keep an eye on the YouTube chat, and, and that'd be great. Thanks, Matt. Sure. Uh, do you want to tell us about the next piece we're going to hear? Well, so first of all, we have a, there's a program link um, that people can click on in the YouTube that um, talks about the order. The next piece we're going to do is we, these are from all these pieces that we're going to play are from when we performed at Old First in 2018. Um, and the next week, the next piece is um, Sweet Hermetica. And um, it's by uh, Leduino um, Pitombeira, who's a, a Brazilian composer. And, and just, um, uh, um, well, I, 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 think, I think we can just play the piece and I'll talk a little bit more after it. How's that? Okay, that sounds great. Okay, so here it comes. Um, a, a suite uh, of music by Brazilian yeah. people. Okay. Yes.
Great. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I love that music. <laughs> So, so it was written by uh, Ludwino uh, Pitombeira, who's a Brazilian composer, who is who is a really nice guy, actually. I've communicated when we played this in the past. And he wrote it after uh, a, a, a musician named, um, well, his name was Hermeto. I can't remember his first name now. And uh, he, I think Hermeto is his first name, Hermeto Pascual. Oh, okay, yes. And, and so sweet Hermetica. And the last movement is a is a dance is a regional dance. Um, that's you heard the last movement is a lot faster, and uh, yeah. So uh, it's and and we play you know Quinta Latino plays music by both we say by Latinos, and what we mean by that is um, composers who say that their roots and their culture and their identity comes out of Latin America. So that can be someone who actually was born and raised and is still living in Latin America. It could be someone who was born in Latin America and came to the U.S. or someone like me who also identifies as Latino, who was born and raised and comes from the United States. So um, we play any of those. This one is Brazilian. That year we played all Brazilian composers by chance. It's really nice. Um, so... In this first section, uh, now you mentioned that uh, one of the reasons you started Quinteto Latino was uh, arose from your experience um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, could you talk a little bit about about the origins of the uh, ensemble? Well, so I, you know, I grew up playing the trumpet. The um, and I, I always loved music, and and I always was good at it. I, I, I learned trumpet when I was a young man, and I think by the fourth or fifth grade, I was also teaching myself piano. And um, I just was it was the it was the funnest thing I was doing. I felt like when I was in school as a, as a child, and I didn't I didn't school was really hard for me. I I I, I went to a school where there were very few people of color. Even in my high school, there was only five Latinos in the whole school. If you can imagine a California high school with five Latinos, but it was at the time, even in San Jose in the 1980s. And, um, and I said, really had a very um, a, a difficult kind of social experience. It, but music was always the thing that kind of saved me and kept me whole and kept my spirit um, whole and intact. And in high school, um, I, they needed more French horn players, and I started playing the French horn, and I, I loved it. And, um, and I found orchestral music. And so a couple of things happened in, in when I was around 16 or 17. One is that my parents uh, found um, a youth orchestra, and I started playing youth orchestra fell in love with orchestral music because we only had band in my, in my high school. Number two is um, I started getting lessons. So they finally gave me some lessons. I think I was 17 when I started having my first French horn lessons. It was from a, a musician who was a baritone player. But I remember he, he, I finally got lessons. And the, and the last thing was that I saw a French horn player for the first time in my life who was playing in a professional orchestra who wasn't um, white. And it was a person of color. I was 17. And, um, and I remember that day very clearly that I had been looking for someone that looked like me in every orchestra I looked at. I, I, and I used to watch them on PBS. I used to watch orchestras all over. And I loved orchestral music as a child and growing up, but I never saw anybody who looked like me. But when I saw him, and it was Jerome Ashby, and he was the associate principal of the New York Philharmonic at the time, I thought that was the day I knew I could play French horn. And, and, it, and it's, it's strange that it took me until that moment to, I needed to see someone that looked like me to know that I could belong. And, um, and I went to, to community college and then I went to UCLA and I studied two things, Chicano studies and uh, French horn performance. And all my Chicano studies friends were like, why are you playing the French horn? And all my music, um, musician friends were all, why are you studying Chicano studies, which is the study of Latinos in the US, Latino US history. But there wasn't a place where those two things intersected ever. And I felt really, when I was studying, very torn and pulled between those two places. And, and um, also in the music departments, very few Latinos, just one or two, maybe. 
And then I went on to grad school and studied French horn performance. And what I realized after that whole time of studying and etudes and the concertos and the sonatas and the theory class and the musicology that I, that I had the entire time only studied to the best of my ability and performed white male composers. And I knew that they were composers like Lidwino Pitombera or like the com next composer that we're going to hear, Carlos Chavez, beloved and loved throughout Latin America and almost never played in the U.S. And that that it would it's hard for students like me when I was a student to be able to study and commit my life to something that didn't that where I didn't feel represented, both in humans that are playing the music and also the pieces that we're performing. So thus, thus was the genesis of the, uh, of the idea for Quintet Latino to have a wind quintet that only played Latino composers and to show the, the performing arts field that there are so many Latino composers that you could have a whole organization that's committed to only that. In fact, there's so many wind quintets that you could have a whole organization that only plays those kind of composers. So that's how Quintet Latino got started and what we are today. Yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic, and um, it's so true that uh, that uh, the Latino composers um, there's such a great amount of music out there, and it's it doesn't get played. And um, I, I think you mentioned something uh, when you were attending a, a conference or something. Everyone couldn't believe that you were playing classical music. They thought, oh. Uh, well Latino uh, musician, you must be playing some jazz or, um, you know, something else. Right, right. And what it, and what or what it must sound like. So, we're we're fighting a couple of different things here. One is that um, I, I I do consider myself, uh, um, you know, a social activist and definitely a leader within the field. Both not only of my own nonprofit, but I you know I sit on a, n a number of. Um, boards and do a lot of volunteer work and public speaking about this issue. And, um, but even, even my presence and if I'm performing at a conference or I could be speaking on a panel, there's a lot of stereotypings in, in the field where someone like me who looks like me um, would be stereotyped to be a jazz musician. You know, that would be the assumption, Quintato Latino to our, our stereotype would be that they would have to be something that was jazz, right? Or wouldn't be contemporary classical music, which is what it is. You know, this season we're playing three pieces and two of them are commissions. So um, it's it's a lot of educating the field at large around what, what I'm doing, what's possible, what does Latino mean about Latino identity? We talk a lot about that wherever we go. Great. It looks like we have a question about uh, the early struggles of um, what maybe you could talk about uh, when you first uh, started concertizing with Quinteto Latino. Um, what what did you find uh, as far as the audiences or uh, the venues? Um, what what kind of reception did you get uh, at the beginning? Well, I think we can have talk about this in terms of like how we curate each season's programming. Okay. And what I found early on in 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 our existence that we would play where we come on a stage and we're called Quinteto Latino. What do we what does an audience think it's gonna sound like? And we jazz was one thing, um, often like a folk song or folky. Or what does what does a stereotype Latin American music sound like in the U.S.? And so what we would do is we would meet that stereotype somewhat. So we would play a folk song, or we play a pop song, so that when we came on the stage, what they thought they were going to hear, they were going to hear. And then we would kind of lead them more towards the the uh, contemporary music or the classical sounding music, but always kind of bookending it with something that meeting their expectation. And um, and that was kind of a, 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 a early way of kind of uh, uh, scaffolding audiences into what we what we truly our identity was, which is a lot of contemporary um, music by Latino composers. And so um, uh, that was one part of the struggle, just to get in. in still, is a struggle to uh, get presenters to 
uh, take the risk to um, present a group called Quinteto Latino, because that's not something, a word that you see associated with classical music. And then the other thing that now that we've evolved in almost two decades of existence into talking more explicitly about race equity is something we do in everything we're doing in formal concerts, in, in our education opportunities, in our community building, in our public speaking, in our consulting, that um, that's also can, can feel uh, unwieldy for a presenter. You know, and I, that's why I just, I again, appreciate Matt, you giving me the opportunity to freely talk about these issues at a concert. It's actually very rare for us to be able to openly discuss it. So, um, uh, the, and the struggle goes on today. The struggle is on today that, that whether um, con people who, who put on concerts are willing to talk about these issues openly. Quintet Latino talks about them everywhere we go. Yes, definitely. That's, uh, that's terrific. And, uh, and we're very grateful that you're spending this time with us because this is a, a rare opportunity. We don't, um, you know, part of it is, um, you know, born of necessity with the pandemic. We have different um, programming restrictions, but, but we have uh, definitely appreciated your relationship with Old First Concerts over the years. And, um, you know, we look forward to continuing this great discussion. Um, so uh, would you like to introduce the next piece for us? Yes. So uh, for the next one, we it's a couple of movements from a multi-movement work. I mentioned this composer uh, before, Carlos Chavez who's a Mexican composer, beloved, well-known patriarch in Mexico, almost never performed in the U.S. And Chavez um, uh, uh, wrote a lot of different kinds of music. He was a nationalist composer. He also um, uh, started an orchestra that mixed indigenous and Western instruments. And at the time, you know, probably 100 years ago, he was incredibly chastised for that and had to stop doing that. But he did write music that mixed the indigenous and Western together. Um, and this piece is um, based on, um, oh gosh, I, I, I never, I'm never good with the terminology, it's essentially not repeating um, a, a, uh, uh, something in, until you've done all the other notes. Or, but, I, but he does it in everything, in dynamics, he does it in... Um, uh, with pitches, he does it um, uh, with value sets. So, um, and it, it's it's it can sound quite pointed. It's really fun to play. We, and it, you know, it's it's funny. When I play contemporary music by a Mexican composer, there's something about it that my Latino audience members, since we have really mixed audiences, quinto Latino, really connect to it. And it's amazing what they hear in the in this contemporary. Well, it's 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 old, it's mid last century, you know, work. It still feel for Latinos, it still feels Latino to them, which is I just always really profound for me. Anyways, this so a five movement work. It's called Soli number two, the whole work, because each movement is for a solo instrument of the quintet. So we're gonna hear the two movements, one that's for um, oboe solo movement and one is a bassoon solo movement. Thank you. 
All right, welcome back, everyone. That was my, that was my buddy colleague Sean Jones on the bassoon at the end there. You know, I um, we just we just finished some new recordings last week. It was the first time in a year we got together. Finally, we're able to find a place that let us to play without masks, and um, it was just so awesome to play together. And there was there was a couple of the, um, one of the pieces in particular, there was so much duo between the horn and bassoon in, 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 um, in a wind quintet, you know, you kind of have the high winds, the flute, oboe, clarinet, and then the low, which is the bassoon and horn, and the clarinet kind of fill in the middle, clarinet and horn. Clarinet really has the most notes in the wind quintet. She is playing all the time, but the, the bassoon and horn are always so in duet, you know, constantly where the, where the low, low part and, um, and I just feel so close to my colleague, Sean. We've been playing together for so long next to each other. It's amazing. And I love, I love he's, he does a great job in that movement. There was a few questions in the chat. I wonder, if, do you mind just, maybe we just knock those out in the beginning here? Sure, Is absolutely. That okay? Yeah. So I'm, I'm just gonna read, uh, there's a few here. Um, the sound of the group is exceptional. Each musician has such an idiomatic rich tone. My question, the group has a terrific rhythmic precision energy do you think that is due to your repertoire um i uh this is I, I love to answer questions all questions in in my work in um race equity and in change in classical music and this this question is no different the first the first thing is that um that all five of us in the group were classically trained conservatory trained musicians so we have, I have I, the same training as everybody else. And it doesn't make me any um, less necessarily more um, capable of playing something that is Latino West repertoire or Latino rhythm, other than just having that identity, actually. Um, and having maybe, you know, maybe a slightly more Latino experience than someone who wasn't Latino. But the rep, but we, we, we learned this rep and, and um, like any other Western classical musician with a similar training. But what I found is in, in playing this rep that wasn't steeped necessarily in singularly Euro-centric tradition is that when we go back to our training and go back, you'll hear in the next piece, when we go back to more um, uh, um, Euro-centric composers, that those composers sound totally different and better because we 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 worked on this other repertoire that was not standard and here's where here's where the um the uh, social change comes in there's a big discussion in classical music with private instructors do we diversify the rep that we're teaching our students and the students are asking for it they want more diverse rep but then the instructors are like well well then when they go in the field they're not going to have the standard rep Right. They're going to they're going to have other rep that's not standard. And my point is that if they play some of the standard rep, most of it still, and just learn some other rep, then actually it'll make the standard rep better. That's what happened in Quinta Latino, because we played all this other non-standard rep. Whenever we go back to the standard rep, which we rarely play or something that sounds like it, it sounds so much better. And we approach it with a whole other um, uh, level of understanding and um, and just different entry points. Yeah, that also, so, um, I think that also goes to the point that the reason uh, that it's standard rep is because it's been uh, created within this kind of white male aesthetic, like that that is what music is supposed to sound like. So that's why it's the standard rep, you know. Um, everything is measured against that. Everything is measured in comparison to that. Right, yes, exactly. yeah. And I think, yeah. you know, um, a, a good example where uh, some change is happening is like uh, one of our regular um, composers on the series, Hiyoshi Na, 
um, the Korean uh, woman composer, and um, her work has become uh, part of the curriculum in Korea, it, part of the general, uh, you know, the test for pianists to, to progress. And, um, you know, that's, that's great because that, um, in Korea, they are taking her music as a, as a new standard, as a, a new, um, uh, you know, kind of the established repertoire. And, um, you know, we'd love to see more of that kind of change here as well. Yeah, but, and, and I think from what I hear from students in my work, all again, all over the U.S. and a lot of the instructors is, is they want to see it too. And it's, it's like, who's going to make the first move, you know? And, and it get, this gets into a discussion about who's really controlling our systems here? Who's making the final decisions about these systems? And, um, and, 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 and like so many things in the U.S., a lot of it is the, the funders, you know, the larger institutions and um, the people in charge of, the, uh, of those institutions, the conductors, you know, those who's ultimately making those decisions and, and how do we get those influence those people to change these, these standards? It's um, a, a, bigger, a bigger power question, for sure. Great. Now, I know uh, you talked a little bit about seeing um, a French horn player that looked like you. Uh, can yeah. you talk a little bit about uh, what, uh, what Quinteto Latino is, is doing as far as uh, nurturing young musicians uh, now that are coming up uh, out, of, you know, out of the schools? into the classical music. Yeah, profession. yeah, sure. There's, there's um, first of all, Quintet Latino started as a quintet and we principally were that, I'd say for a good, it's hard to say when it happened, when the tipping point was about eight to 10 years in, um, that we started really, I, I, I guess I just had the headspace and the mindset to, and, and enough cachet in the field to think, wait a minute, I wanna do more than just play. I wanna try it, how can we be, um, uh, the uh, the impetus for some actual change in the field, the systems change I was just mentioning. And so now Quinta Latino is a nonprofit. So it's five musicians and five part-time staff people. And um, I'm the executive director and the founder and the French horn player. And there's essentially, and we have a board now, and there's three programming areas. It's education, it's um, the composer's musician, it's the performance. And the last one is advocacy, education, performance, and advocacy. And so in the education realm, we're talking about um, uh, what happens when a child enters kindergarten and how do they grow up to become the classical musician if they want to be. And the difference in access and in staying on and staying in the pipeline, the difference between white, a, a child who goes to a white majority school and a child who goes to a brown majority school. And there's a lot of inequities between those different kinds of schools and the kind of learning, arts learning that happens there and the access to arts and the number of minutes of arts and, the, and whether you have music or not or another art form, whether that teacher is trained and credentialed, all those things are very different at different schools. And so, that allows a child to either stay on that track and stay on it. Where do they fall off? Where do they never see a musician who looks like them and maybe they fall off? You know, where do they, are they playing pieces that represent their identity or their value sets or their families or their neighborhoods? Or, um, and how, how does that help them to stay on track so that they can become the musician that they want to be? So just the, it's about talking about those issues and, and making people aware about those differences. And of course, we do education program. We do workshops. I train teachers. I lead cohorts of teaching artists. I do professional development. I lead a cohort of Latino um, teaching artists that go into schools on behalf of Quintato Latino. So we have the, that programming. The advocacy is evolved uh, is around classical musicians and um, um, supporting Latino classical musicians and coming together so that um, we can be a cohort of musicians and build power together. When I play in an orchestra, almost 100% of the time, 
I'm the only Latino. We live in a state with 50% of the students are Latinos in the schools. And every orchestra I play in is 100% non-Latino except me. Why is that? And how can we build awareness about why that's happening? And the few classical musicians that are there around the country that are Latinos and have made it to this point, I, I, we bring them together and we want to be a supportive network for each other and we want to build power together. And we have discussions about what does classical music need to do better to support Latino musicians. So that's the advocacy part. In addition to the performance, which is, of course, performing, commissioning. Um, we're about to launch a series of talks, talking to Latino composers, presenting that. So those are the areas how we support the Latino identity in classical music. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's time to move on to our next piece. So uh, could you give a quick intro and we'll move on? Sure. The next piece is is kind of a, a juxtaposition of the classical and the kind of Western classical mixed with the Latino and all three movements. You'll see the kind of stereotype Latino. The first one is a tango um, and um, and and and. It's, it's, but it sounds and feels very Western classical. And the composer, um, uh, uh, Medaglia, just the, just rides this line perfectly. And, and I want to say, this is very typical of Latino composers. You know, we uh, have one foot, it's like we have one foot in Latin America and one foot in Europe, you know. And because... You know, these these instruments have been on in Latin America since colonization. And me, too. I have one foot in in my, um, you know, Euro Eurocentric training and one foot in just like when I was in college, I was saying I say Chicano studies and French horn performance. I was I'm, I'm stuck in both. And many of these compose the same way. And I love how Medaglia rides this line between those two things and crosses them over perfectly it's just and it's a good fit for us as a as a latino wind quintet you know.
Thanks, Matt, for playing that. I love, I love that hearing my colleague Diane Gruby on the flute. She's got um, some wonderful, uh, you know, I'm always amazed how many notes she can fit into one beat. Those flute players. <laughs> And, yeah, and, that's, and, uh, that is a lot of fun, and I always, I always love those little endings, uh, little uh, yes, clever Super endings. Sweet. Yes, yeah, very, very satisfying ending. <laughs> Great. Um, so this, uh, this brings us into our uh, final section of our discussion uh, this evening, and and um, you know, there's, it seems like diversity, equity, inclusion is the big buzzword right now uh, with foundations and uh, funding and uh, power structures and and everything. And um, uh, Armando and I talked a little bit about this uh, the other day, and and we said, you know, it's it's interesting because it doesn't feel like there's been uh, much change that we've been able to to notice. I mean. Change is a, something that happens and doesn't happen in a smooth progression, obviously. Um, there's yeah. big, big changes can suddenly happen. But, um, you know, we have to, uh, you know, we're kind of wondering what what is it that needs to happen to really um, kind of break through the... Uh, you know, the dominant paradigm of classical music, you know, we, I mean, we obviously um, have struggled with the the white male dominance of the art form for a really long time. In fact, it's, it's just so baked in that, yeah. um, you know, it's almost people don't like seem to almost forget about it. And, um, you know, we've, we have, I've, personally noticed progress in uh, the last couple years of really uh, a lot of women composers have uh, begun to get recognition for their work and um, it's getting performed a lot more though certainly not enough but um, I, I definitely have noticed a bit of a change in there but what um, what is it going to take to um, keep the ball rolling, especially for um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, musicians and composers? Um, well, first, I think that the the setup for 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 me is like, where where do I center this this lack of movement in in my heart? Because it's going to eat up. It would eat me up. And I, I see it up a lot of musicians. So how do I stay whole as a person, as a man, as a as a person of color playing the French horn, and and against this 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 big system? So the 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 um, that I want to speak to that first, and that's because I really care about how BIPOC musicians navigate and survive this. And the way I the way I think about it is I learned it from my parents. My parents were social change activists and political activists growing up in San Jose. And I was brought up with that. And I felt like they worked really hard their whole life for this similar change in the, in, in the fields and the communities they were in. And, um, and I think they saw some change, not a lot, but some. And they were there and, and still, my dad's still alive and he's there for the long haul for this kind of change. He's not giving up, but that's a long haul, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I, my, my dad, my mother passed away last year and she, he said a story about something she had said at w my school when I was in kindergarten to try to create some change at the school. And literally, I had just said the same thing at my son's school, but it was 45 years later. That means we're still fighting the same fight that my mom was fighting 45 years ago. So I'm preparing for my spirit around all the conversations I'm going to have, how much real change am I really going to see? If I'm saying the exact same thing my mom said 45 years ago at my school that I said that a week, you know, that week, um, 45 years later. So um, that's the first thing. So the second thing is, so how does it actually change? There's, there's, I don't have a secret sauce. That my best bets. I was on social media today with some, some people were offering some ideas around it. And what I said was that until the funders 
and the boards and the executive directors are um, woke and, and, and committed and frankly diverse that I just don't think it's possible. So um, uh, there's, I want to say um, somebody offered in a chat, they said something coming out with diversity statements, but they, but they don't, do not feel sincere. How do you recommend navigating that issue? That was one of the questions in the chat. And I think it speaks to this issue that, um, that they often do feel hollow and insincere. And I go back and forth. Do I create my own system with other BIPOC folk? And I do that in some of my programs. Or do I work within existing um, systems? And I'll spend some time there. And I'll spend a good amount of time there and trying to sway influence there. But I make my own systems with the people who look and care about the same things as me because I refuel here and I recharge here. And this white system really pulls from me and is extractive. And this system feeds my spirit and my soul. And so I really have to do both. And, um, and, that's, and I hope to set up systems for other BIPOC folk too. And, and we do, we do, we do, do that at King Tatlatin. We, we work hard to do that. But I just, um, and then I want to reiterate what an important ally you are here today, Matt, allowing me to talk about these issues along with the music in this deep a way is really unusual for a presenter I've had in the U.S. So I just thank you for that, too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I send out a weekly email and, uh, you know, most of our people uh, read that. Um, and this week I used a quote from uh, Audre Lorde, uh, who is a, uh, a black lesbian poet activist. And um, the quote I used was about diversity, but... Um, she, all, she had another quote that struck me, and it okay. said, um, the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house. And I thought, you know, that's, that's kind of what uh, we're talking about with, with the funders and um, foundation. Those are the master's tools. Those are the tools of the culture. Oppression. And we're not yeah. going to dismantle the system. So, no. um, so I think it is really up to uh, kind of the ground, the ground roots, you know, and and um, you know the musicians, but also you know finding support. Uh, I know our audiences are incredibly responsive uh, to music that challenges them and that uh, breaks out of their paradigm. So, um, yeah, that's great. So, you know, and um, I think, I think if people gave it a chance, if other presenters would, you know, gave that a chance, they would find the same thing. I think. I think so too. Again, we've, we've talked about this a few times. Who's going to press go first. Who's going to start, who's going to take the risk. And, um, and I, yeah, again, I really feel like Matt, you've done a great job in curating, you know, old first to give the audience opportunities to, um, hear a, a different kinds of music and what, what really like kind of redefining for the field, what is chamber music, you know, what constitutes chamber music. And I always appreciate it about you, you and, and your audiences too. So, um, thank you for that. Great. Um, Let's see. Wow. You know, this is this is such a great topic and I'm sure we, we could talk all night uh, uh, about it. Um, and we have many thoughts about it. Um, I, I was also thinking um, today about our uh, Julius Eastman concert that we had uh, yeah. a, a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, his sound world was so different and amazing and not at all in the kind of uh, white experience. Um, and, you know, and he couldn't get his music played when he, when he was alive. But, um, you know, that that's the kind of thing that I feel we miss so much. And, um, and we got, we got to get that out 
so we can hear it and experience that and, and learn and listen. And um, thank you for your great work um, in, you know, spreading the word and, and really encouraging um, people to, to embrace uh, new ways of understanding, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in classical music. Yeah, thanks, Matt. You too, and, and good work to you too. And I always appreciate talking to you about these topics. It's very unusual to have a presenter that I can actually talk about this with, much less on on in a concert. So I just I can't I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Really, oh, thank you. Great. Well, um, we're going to go on to our final piece of the evening, and it's um, it's the same composer as the last piece. Yes, the final two movements. It's a three movement work, and the second one is um, is a slower. Uh, uh, soulful piece depicted mostly by the oboe and my colleague uh, Kyle Bruckman and um, you know the whole all the quintets from the Bay Area were based in the San Francisco Bay Area two folks in San Francisco two in in the in Oakland and, and I live in Menlo Park and we rehearse in San Francisco and Oakland we're truly Bay Area based and um so this one, this one does feature uh, Kyle on the oboe in the second movement. The last movement um, is uh, called uh, Requinta Malu uh, Maluca, which essentially means kind of a crazy little clarinet. And that's, she, Leslie's playing her, if you know clarinets, the smaller E-flat clarinet, um, which play, was kind of the piccolo clarinet of the clarinet family in this last movement. So that, that's how we're going to end the concert. It's always fun to end the concert with that piece from Leslie too. And she's, she does a great job with it. So yeah. Thank and you, man. You know, Armando, I, I apologize, but I think I only included the third movement. So, um, Oh, Oh, so, okay. No problem. So we'll just I, hear I, the I think I missed Leslie. the second movement. So, um, <laughs> but we do have the third movement for you with Leslie's. Body, sounds good. So, that um, sounds good. So please okay. enjoy. Thank you so much, Armando. And I um, just want to say, if anybody in the audience wants to be in touch about any of these issues, uh, you know, around Latino identity and classical music or BIPOC issues or education or advocacy, just you know, uh, look me up. If you can, you can in in Quintet Latino or just Google Armando and French horn, you'll find me. And um, and I'm happy to be in touch and do any follow up. So thanks, Matt. Okay, thanks. Here we go uh, with the final movement. All right, bye bye.